This is Volunteer Radio. In the program Insights, now we bring you a discussion on digital currency benefits and concerns. The participants are Udyan Ray, economic analyst, and V. Ravi Kumar, AIR correspondent. After the announcement to then on 7th October, when RBI said that they're going to do a pilot launch of the digital rupee in the wholesale segment, RBI has actually gone ahead and launched this. So before we get into the various aspects of the digital rupee, tell us briefly what is CBDC, this term which has been bandied around for almost over a month now. The short part of this whole thing is it's central bank digital currency. So it's a digital currency, the currency that you hold, the rupee. You're not holding it in a physical form, which is what you can slip into your wallet. And uh, it's there as in the other digital wallets that it's the kind of rupee that resides in your digital wallets. It is that virtual digital kind of currency. And in that sense, it's a similar kind of animal that resides in your digital wallet if you're using that. And sometimes if you're making payments through your mobiles or through net banking, anything other than actually handing over the cash, it is that same category of animal in terms of money that CBDC is talking about. The reason why it's CBDC because it's been issued by the central bank and instead of being able to hold it in your hand and feeling good about it, you can only see something on screen or something like that where you're not physically holding it. But the advantages are everything that you can have in terms of money is concerned. You can buy, sell, do everything that you can do with money. You can do that. Only thing is that you will not be holding it. You use the term e-wallet, uh, digital wallet uh, often in your answer. Next question that I segue to, a lot of people who are listening to it right now have been probably using e-wallets for almost half a decade, probably more. But how is CBDC different from the e-wallet that they already use? What basically the government and RBI, because RBI is going to be spearheading it, it's going to be issuing the central bank digital currency. Now, what RBI doesn't want to do is replace them. It wants to give you another option, whether it's corporates. Right now, it's they'll broadly, which we'll probably be discussing a little later. So there are two variants. They're looking at institutions using the digital currency and then looking at people like you and me using it. And uh, so they don't want to replace currency or wallet or anything. They want to give one more option where you can use it. Now, what is the difference in terms of an experience? You know, the experience of not holding some cash in your hand, but, you know, transferring it or receiving it on your mobile or you're getting to know somehow that you've got it. The experience will be exactly the same. What will be different would be something which you which we don't get to see. It will be at the back end. So when you and I, suppose you and I were to make a transaction, what's happening is you and I might, might in real time be able to pass the money, but our banks or any other place which is holding that money actually will have to square off the transaction. They'll have to balance their books and that transaction has to happen. It takes a little bit of time to do that. I mean, time by today's standard. And there is a some level of cost. It's not very high because it's digital, but there is cost. Now, what RBI and the government are trying to do is make sure that that part, which we cannot see, happens very fast. And the argument is that, among the many other arguments, is that it will make the whole system faster, things will happen smoother, secure, etc., etc. So you're basically saying that uh, this currency, digital currency, CBDC, would be faster and smoother, probably more cost-efficient. And if I were to pro probably take an analogy, somebody who's using a 2016 phone and which probably had a very old operating system and now has a 2022 and which has the latest operating system. So would somebody, the moment CBDC is launched in the retail segment, right now it's only launched in the wholesale segment, somebody gets this retail segment, so will the adoption be instant or would he be wondering, is this really better from the e-wallet that I already use? Well, I suspect it will be the latter, Ravi, because if lots of people who are using it and the, it's grown by leaps and bounds in, in India, digital transactions have grown insane, unbelievable rate. So it's very impressive. But even as we talk about that, we wonder about the progress out there. Remember, we are an economy which is growing by leaps and bounds also. Now, what has also happened is despite the increasing digitization in terms of payments, a lot of digital payments that are being made, the use of cash, physical cash has not gone down. It's going up at a very healthy clip. Now, there's no point in looking down on that because United States also uses a lot of cash. There are lots of countries which use a lot of cash. And on the other side, there are lots of other countries which 
which don't use cash. So Scandinavian countries, specifically countries like Sweden or Denmark, they don't use that much cash. Almost cash has gone out of fashion. So the point is that we will probably have to look at what will work for certain people. Youngster, but I'm quite hopeful because youngsters, people who are just entering the workforce, they're more, they've grown up with a mobile, unlike people of our generation within courts. So their adoption is much faster. They'll try to quickly figure out in which context or in which situations will work and in which it won't work so well. But Ravi, the point is here, the whole thing is between you are, for an individual I'm talking about, the retail side, it will be between the individual and the RBI and RBI and the individual. So it's a straightforward thing. There are no other entities involved. When you're holding the currency, it's between you and RBI. Now the question is, what kind of a system RBI is going to adopt? Now the development that you're talking about today and perhaps one month or one and a half months down the line and the retail part is going to get launched. That's what RBI is trying to figure out. What works well in our country? Now, so many countries are trying to do this. What will work well for us and what will not work well for us? You need to do this. Try it out. And actually, that's why the word pilot project is happening. And people want to figure out what will work for the institution and what will work for us. And eventually, like all systems that we have evolved, we will come up with a model of our own and which will be good and smart and cool. Yeah, you mentioned one thing in uh, while talking about this is about cash. Now, cash is something that needs to be printed. It has a cost. It needs to be maintained. It gets torn. Then it has to be replaced. And of course, RBI was looking at plastic currency in between. And in between, we have the CBDC coming in. So you already mentioned that this system would be faster, smoother, more cost efficient. Let's talk about some more advantages of this, possible advantages. One, you already mentioned cash because there's a huge cost to printing cash. So I'm assuming that will be saved in this, but it will also bring attendant costs. So what are the other advantages you can see going down the path? Well, one of the major things that obviously has spurred the government is we obviously need not go into it in great detail is cryptocurrency because all over the world and including in, in our country, governments for security and many other reasons, financial stability is very important. People, the monetary authority, which is the RBI or the government, they want to have a hold or rather supervisory control over the system. Now, what happens is the cryptocurrencies which are being held as being alternative to holding national currencies was becoming a problem because there are lots of activities which you can indulge in which are not inimical to the interest of the country or countries and they would happily bypass the system, supervisory and other systems. And in case somebody with the right intention also holds it and there's a problem, there's a run or something like that, there's no way way by which you can secure the interests of the person who's holding that, okay? Whether you're holding it as a currency or as an asset. Now, that is a sense why one of the reasons which brought the urgency to the government, governments across the world have been looking at it. But the kind of popularity and the certain surge of cryptocurrency was something which the RBI and the government, they don't like it. They've said it in so many words and they've given the various reasons, some of them which I already mentioned. That had to be checked. You have to provide a market-based alternative which will work. So this was one important. When you have the government actually backing a currency and the only minus out there was you didn't have a digital currency. Now you have it. So a person need not even consider a cryptocurrency and one can look at a digital currency and just in case you want to do that. So that is number one. Number two is the movement of money. So one is, of course, we go to a shop and do it or make some payments. But there are also other kinds of payments which are becoming very, very important, Ravi. One is, of course, as you know, we get a lot of inward remittance. I mean, somebody who's employed abroad and has to send money across to his or her family members in the country. We have got about five to six lakh students, Indian students who are studying abroad. So they have to be supported by their parents. So that money has to go. Now, look, what happens is, A, these transfers at the moment, they take time because lots of entities are involved, lots of regulations. You have to establish identity, why you're doing it, etc., etc., etc. Now, and you have to do it secure and it takes time. Now, the argument is when you have central bank digital currencies across the globe, this whole procedure will get speeded up. You won't have to fill up those long forms and long templates online to transfer money, give enormous documentation when you're receiving money. So these things can happen fast, it can happen secure. Most importantly, the costs will go down. Every time you do a transfer, you end up seeing a decent percentage of that money being pocketed by the bank or financial intermediaries. It's a question of how much less you'll get it done through. So that is also a very important point which people are looking at. Now there are lots of very good foolproof systems that are coming in. 
that and they're going hand in hand with secure banking, secure payments. So when you introduce something like this, the security and also the compliance, the people who are doing it, offering it, you using it, they don't have to spend hours and hours or maybe uh, spend a couple of crores or millions in complying. So if you do that, if you use this kind of currency, my sense is that eventually you're looking at saving time, you're looking at saving cost, it'll happen smoother, it'll probably be secure. It's not going to happen overnight. There will be glitches on the way. We have you know, established lots of systems. We have established the GST, etc. They didn't where we are today. It just didn't happen overnight. You know, you keep figuring out what works, what doesn't work. And over a period of time, through feedback and understanding, you do that. But the idea is, if you look at the concept node, which you talked about, RBI is trying to keep a architecture reasonably open to innovation. So that will change in the market or other things will happen. You will be able to adapt to it. The other part is, of course, because it's digital, you can adapt better, much easier. It's not, you're not putting up buildings and having thousands of people out there. Things can happen much quicker. So those are the advantages that we look at. But there's a question that I was just looking at a news article published that UPI was something that was launched in August 2016, barely six years old, six and a half years old, you could say. And you see that today they have almost 11 trillion rupees in terms of value and 7 billion transactions, which means if you take the adult population of India to be around 70 billion, one in 10 adults made at least one transaction in the month of October. UPI is a huge success. Other countries like US are trying to replicate it. What does this bring to the table which is different from UPI, which is already existing and already a success? If you look at low-hanging fruits, I would say international remittance, etc., that's where it holds promise. In the settling financial institutions, for instance, the pilot project which got launched today, it's, it's covering government securities, secondary market. So there they'll get to know, that's a hypothesis, they think that it will work out better. So these are some of the places where it will start working well. But what also it does, Ravi, is sometimes things happen at, at a much bigger scale. An individual will say, okay, fine, I've got an UPI, I'll see whether I want to do it. Now, suppose a pandemic like this happens, like the one which we just went through. You can't go to the bank. You still need some cash. Now, the argument, which is there, in the, I think, in the concept paper, instead of holding cash, you can keep the digital currency. So, it's not going to happen every day and every now and then. These things happen once in hundred. But those are the extreme cases. Other way of looking at it, there's a lot of times there's this whole complaint that, you know, RBI is cut rates, but rather is raised rates. And we are not seeing the fixed deposit rates going up, etc., etc the transmission issues. Now what happens is if people start holding digital currency, then what also happens is the transmission of any policy might just become a little better. I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to be magical, magically transform it. But what happens is, and then you can start tracking, you know, while anonymity of cash transaction is something which is important, at least at partially for this to be successful, that's my personal opinion. Privacy of transactions will be very important to a certain extent. So that's another thing which RBI will be trying to figure out. What is the optimal level? That is actually bringing me to my next question. We yeah. talked about advantages, but there are, you mentioned tracking, you mentioned privacy concerns. So quickly tell us, because one year back, the digital renminbi which is a chinese digital currency was also launched at that time there was a lot of criticism saying that it will probably even be human rights violation because there has to be some anonymity in uh, cash transactions so what in your mind are quickly the disadvantages or the concerns that cbdc raises well cbdc the biggest thing is how does a person get his hand or her hands on cbdc how easy or how difficult will it be will it be an app what is it if it's going to be cumbersome you can forget about it nobody's going to touch it so that's number one number two is how much of there are things i do with cash and you might be doing with cash do i really want the government to know every bit of it large transaction yes small amounts no Right. So if, but so the question is, how much can I hold? Where can I get? And how much information will the government get to know? And how quickly I will I be able to change one form of money to the other? So how can I quickly move on from there to get into wallet and otherwise? And how would others be using it? Can I use it anywhere? Can I use it in the airport? All government places? Pay my taxes through it? So all these things will start becoming important. And if they don't work out well, they automatically become disadvantages. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ravi. You are listening to a discussion on digital currency, benefits and concerns. The participants were Udyan Ray, economic analyst, and V. Ravi Kumar, AIR correspondent. This program was produced and presented by the New Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at AIRNSDTalks at gmail.com.